pleasure to have all of you here uh, for the BCTR Talks of 12. Uh, we're winding down the semester. We're finishing up with some really great presentations, uh, one after another. <coughs> These are all our pilot grant awardees. Uh, we have an annual pilot grant competition for faculty and, and senior staff to submit proposals. Uh, we fund those six or seven of those a year. Uh, so uh, we feature again today a, uh, a couple of our awardees uh, who got a pilot grant for this current year. And we just awarded, uh, I think, seven more pilot grant uh, awardees for next year. So um, that will be posted on our website. So anyway, I'm John Eckenrode. If I haven't met everybody, I'm director of the center. And I'm here to introduce our, our, our two distinguished uh, colleagues. Uh, Anthony Burrow, who's an assistant professor in human development, and um, he tackles very light issues. I mean, and I, I, think, I, I figure he's, he's a kind of resident philosopher scientist, because who else would tackle issues of meaning and purpose, which we've been kind of arguing about for thousands of years in both Eastern and Western philosophy, and Anthony's going to kind of figure this out anyway, and at least try to, you know, get do some research on how adolescents and kids achieve meaning and purpose in their lives, and maybe even think about how to do interventions about how to, to encourage a sense of meaning and purpose in the lives of adolescents. So that's one area of his research, and that was the focus of this, this uh, pilot study that they're, they're doing with Janice. He also does a lot of work on racial stereotypes, and that's another area, a whole other area of his work that he won't talk too much about today, uh, but we'll have him come back and talk about that work some other time. Uh, so welcome, uh, Anthony. Uh, he's working with Janice on this project. Janice Whitlock is a, is a research scientist with the center. Um, she does also work on adolescence, with, uh, broadly around issues of health and well-being, mental health issues. She runs the uh, program on self-injurious behavior, research on self-injurious behavior here in the center. Uh, so Janice uh, is uh, uh, an integral part of the work we do here as well. So Janice and, and Anthony have, uh, Tony have worked together on this project. So I'm going to turn it over to them, and um, we look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Thanks a lot. <clears throat> and come on, there's another. Uh, I'm sorry, outside on the table, there, we have another presentation on Thursday. So if you really like this, come back on Thursday, have lunch, and we'll have another one of these. So. Great, thank you. Um, can everyone see me or should I stand up? It would be better if I stood up. Okay, I just want to see some head nods. Okay, so let me situate here. Um, thank you for that introduction and thank you all for being here today to allow us to talk a little bit about our project. Um, this was, as was just mentioned, was a, a project in which was supported, in fact, funded by the BCCR. And um, for me, this is a real treat to be back because I think a year ago or a little bit over a year ago, I was in the same space here talking, see some familiar faces, was talking about, uh, at that time, kind of more broadly about my research on uh, meaning and purpose in life and the conduct of adolescence. And the goal of that talk was to more squarely situate purpose in the context of normative adolescent adjustment, to ask what, what benefit is it for you to engage with this concept in terms of how they adjust and the types of experiences they have. And today, I think we'll do something a little bit more specific, a little bit more narrow than that talk. Um, but that talk was really important for me because it started a conversation with, between me and a lot of people in this room, in fact. Um, and in fact, I think it was even a continuation of a conversation with my, my current collaborator, Janice. Um, and so it was really important. So I just want to say that I appreciate being back here. Um, and one take-home message for those folks who don't know is, I think that if you come to give a talk here at the BTTR, you're liable to walk out with a big chunk of money to go on and do more research. Like, you know, <laughs> it pays literally to, to come give a talk here. Um, yeah, $29.95. <laughs> <laughs> um, and your best. That's right. So um, I should say that what I want to do today is talk a little about the project that we were involved with. But first, I should probably define what I mean or who I mean by we. And of course, Janice was introduced. I think a lot of people in the room, uh, so that everybody knows Janice. Um, we worked collaboratively on this project, but also uh, uh, Jessica Sweetman, or Jess. Uh, she was, for us, a research assistant sitting up here. I asked her to sit up here, and she didn't want to, but that's fine. Um, a research assistant working with us for this entire year. Um, in fact, she was integral to the project, so she knows everything that we've been working on, very familiar. If at any point today you have a question or concerns about the project, direct them to Jess. <laughs> uh, probably better than we would be able to go. Okay, so what I want to do is, um, 
not really connected here, is to give you a little bit of a script of what I want to focus on today. I'll start off by giving you a little bit of the problem or the issue that we saw going forward, what kind of what we wanted to tackle with our research. Um, and here I don't necessarily mean problem, although there was some traumatizing experiences. Um, it wasn't necessarily any, anything really major. It was the issue that we saw we wanted to contend with in, in this project. And it certainly concerns purpose and meaning. And so as I delve into that, I'll give you a little bit of backdrop of what I mean by purpose and meaning or what I think we mean by purpose and meaning. And then we'll talk a little bit about the design or the study we put together. Um, in our conversations as it began, we realized our questions we had, we didn't really have the data in hand to start to answer. So we thought this is this pilot project for us would be as much about a new data collection effort than anything, I'm trying to pair our questions with new data. Um, but I also want to dig deeper there and talk a little bit about the methodological issues, both in terms of what we proposed initially, what we thought we'd be able to do, what we thought would be easy, and then what wasn't so easy. I think Janice will jump in there and talk a little bit about our methods and kind of what we wanted to do versus what we were actually able to do. Um, and then I'll talk a little about some preliminary findings. We're privileged to be able to, I think, share with you today some early findings from our study. Um, when I get to the point where I talk about the timeline for things, you'll see where we are. We're about 75% done with what we said we were going to do. And I think about a week or two ago, we finished our third wave of data collection of four. And for the past week and a half, Jess and I have been sitting in front of a computer trying to make sense of things. But um, to the extent that, that we've done that, I think there's some things I want to share with you that I think are pretty cool so far. And then we'll try to contextualize some of those findings, both in terms of what we're hoping in our next day, wave of data collection to accomplish, um, but also for the project as a whole and kind of the directions we want to take to the pilot project. What are sort of the, the logical next steps we want to parlay this into? Okay, so um, in terms of the problem, um, I think the best most appropriate or fairest place to start here is is really in a conversation or a series of concept conversations that Janice and I had when we first met each other about a year and a half ago or so when I first got to Cornell and um, we sat down and it was clear that we both had an interest in youth development we wanted to understand how youth experience their, their, their lives even their everyday lives and focus on well-being and mental health and I started throwing out terms like meaning and purpose and Janice I think was right on board with that, gravitated to these ideas. We thought these are important things to study if we're going to talk about adolescent adjustment and think about can we collaborate on any project together. But what happened was, as I started talking about purpose, Janice started asking more questions. Like, what do you mean by that? And unpack that for us. What, what are you really trying to get at here? And that was a really important, a series of important conversations that we had through those questions. It was frustrating at times because I thought I was clear, but no, I have to actually unpack this a little bit more. Um, but the reason that was such an important set of conversations is because it was paralleling what was happening in the research literature. If you look at the research literature on purpose, there seems to be conflated terms related to purpose, things like goals or personal strivings, and certainly meaning. And I want to give you an example of, of what I mean by this here. Um, when you turn to the research literature and try to get a sense of how people have discussed, written about, or described purpose, um, what you see here are sort of the, the big uh, ticket ideas in the research literature. These are folks who write pretty extensively on the concepts. This first quote here, this first definition comes from Carol Riff, who's really trying to focus on, or try to focus uh, on and understand purpose in life. She sees purpose as an indicator of psychological well-being. And she defines purpose as a feeling that there is meaning in one's present and past life. So for some of us, that provides some clarity and in, in entry into an understanding of what purpose is, but the word meaning is in the definition. So if you're not quite sure about what either one is, I'm not sure how helpful that is. And it was kind of paralleling the conversations we were having as well. Um, the second definition is by uh, Laura King, who's specifically focusing on meaning in life. Um, in fact, this well-cited paper outlines sort of six or seven empirical studies on meaning in life. And at the outset of that paper, she defines purpose, excuse me, excuse me she defines meaning as the extent to which people comprehend, make sense of, or see significance in their lives, accompanied by the degree to which they perceive themselves to have a purpose, mission, or overarching aim. So again, there may be some clarity here at the beginning of what meaning is, about understanding, trying to understand what one's life has been about, but then it's accompanied by having a sense of purpose. So there's sort of this related concept there. And I think of this as kind of like the... Uh, those motorcycles with the little sidecar, right? That it's, it's clear that these things have some relationship, but I'm not quite sure what the car would do without the motorcycle attached to it. And you kind of get that sense as you read through this. And finally, there's a quote here, a definition by Patrick McKnight and Todd Cashton, and they're specifically trying to understand purpose in life. In this general review of psychology paper, they're saying, here's, a, here's the defining characteristics of purpose, um, and they define it as 
a central self-organizing life aim that organizes and stimulates goals, manages behaviors, and provides a sense of meaning. So, excuse me, even here, there's a sense that purpose is doing something that might be slightly distinguishable from meaning, but then at the end they say that, that one thing purpose does is, is begets meaning. So they seem to be, again, related. And I just want to say here that I think this is both good and bad, and even in our conversations, it enriches the conversation that these are complex ideas, and it adds a dimensionality that in one, you can learn a little bit about the other. So if you have a sense of one, you can kind of get a sense of what's going on. It's not wholly bad you know, to, to think about that complexity there. But from a scientific standpoint, or maybe more specifically from a, from a measurement standpoint, this is a potential problem. Because if we're in the business of understanding things, of exploring and unpacking them, or even intervening on them, we want to be very clear of what we're talking about. This is sort of the equivalent of sort of having two names for the same thing. Oftentimes within the same paper they use interchangeably. So we want a little bit more clarity. And this could be viewed as sort of a problem from a scientific standpoint that people, we're not clear what people mean by either, or if they mean different things. It might be like um, at the end of the talk I say, everybody grab a chair and take it out of the room with you when you leave. So everybody grabs a chair, and I grab the TV, right, because I can sit on the TV. So depending on what we want to be very clear what we mean, because that could be costly to somebody if I walk out of here with the TV. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, in our conversation, what was really helpful was we didn't really have to start from scratch and really trying to discern the difference between purpose and meaning. Others, including those folks on the page, on the slide before this, had already begun this process. A lot of researchers take care to say what we are talking about here is purpose and not meaning, or meaning and not purpose, or distinguish it from other things like goals. So we aren't necessarily inventing that wheel. We just want to contribute to it with a little bit more precision. Um, and for an, for an example of this is the work of Bill Damon and his colleagues at Stanford, uh, Jenny Menon and Kendall Bronk as well. Uh, they define purpose as a stable and generalized intention to accomplish something that's at once meaningful to the self and of consequence to the world beyond the self. So this definition still includes the term meaning, but there's a little bit of clarity here. What seems unique is that purpose involves an intention to do something. There's something out in your future, prospective intention, that you want to go do something. And that thing you want to do is important or meaningful to you, but it's also important to the world around you. This is a really important and I think interesting conversation that's developing is whether or not a sense of purpose needs to be pro-social. Is a sense of purpose, you think about your purpose, if you, you, know, if you thought about this, does it need to involve other people at all? But I think their methodology is, is a clue here that when they talk about purpose, what they're talking about is sort of the why you're pursuing what you're pursuing. And they do their interview process. They ask people, why are you doing this? And it's through that, the answer to the question why, people more times than you might imagine say things that are more pro-social. I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this for my community or my broader society that I, I, feel, I feel connected to. So it seems to be a component there. Um, in a different tone, uh, Michael Sager uh, is focusing on meaning, and he's specifically focusing on meaning and trying to distinguish it from other related concepts. In fact, he has a, a measure, a meaning and life questionnaire, and he thinks of meaning as the sense made of, the significance felt regarding, and the nature of one's being and existence. So it's trying to understand who you are and making sense of it, making sure the world around you kind of is sensical and makes sense and you can kind of grasp what's happening, either in your past or who you currently are. So in one, one sort of blush here, you get a sense that maybe you need a little bit of both to really understand things, but what's missing from this definition of meaning is this sort of generalized intention that is not necessarily sitting in front of you. It may even be present or retrospective, You're trying to grapple with and make sense of things that have already happened, whereas purpose has this sort of future or prospective orientation to it. So what seems clear sort of in summary here is that both purpose and meaning seem related. Um, although it's rare, there have been attempts to, and certainly in the measurement development pieces, to try to disentangle purpose from meaning, but they seem to be correlated with one another. Where you see people measuring both or trying to get at both, they seem to share a relationship. They're not, they're not, they may not be synonymous, but they're also not totally distinct ideas. Um, and they both seem to be good things to have. Uh, where they've been measured, people who have a sense of meaning and people who have a sense of purpose tend to have more positive outcomes. They tend to live longer, have healthier lives. Um, they tend to experience uh, less adverse outcomes in the face of stress um, and better adjustment in daily life, so on and so forth. They tend to be good things to have. But where they may differ is purpose may focus more on a prospective aim. It may involve this externally oriented quest. This is Bill Damon's idea that purpose really involves doing something in the world around you, with the people around you, for them. Um, 
And whereas meaning may involve more reflection and trying to understand so that you can adapt. I want to make sense of what's already happened so that I can understand and maybe even feel better. And a really interesting conversation I think comes up in um, Roy Baumeister's uh, book on this, Meanings of Life, in which he describes this really core state. Meaning involves association and distinction. It's about trying to make sense of what's associated, what's related here, and what's not related here. And to the extent that you can do that, so you can understand what's related and what's not, you can derive meaning, and you can feel better as a result of knowing what's related and what's not. You can adapt to it. Okay. How does all of this, or any of this, fit into the context of youth adjustment? Um, for your benefit, for your sake, I will not delve back into my talk from last year in its entirety, but allow me to say that there by now is what I believe to be convincing empirical evidence and certainly I think ample theoretical uh, basis to think that all youth have the potential to engage with these concepts of purpose and means. Um, when given a chance, sometimes we're, we're surprised, we're shocked at the extent to which they elaborate and they articulate their sense of They're cultivating their sense of purpose in life. They're deriving meaning from their experiences. And so I think our goal in kind of thinking about through this project, it wasn't to pretend to be doing anything new. It wasn't, pre it wasn't to pretend to try to find the dark side of purpose or the dark side of meaning. Both of these things are supposed to be positive, and both of these things are supposed to be accessible to adolescents in a sort of a developmental asset model. That these things, youth who engage with purpose tend to do better. So we didn't necessarily need to reinvent that wheel, but in terms of validating them, saying what might be different about purpose and meaning, then turn to the adult literature and try to, what our job was, I thought, to kind of pull down from the adult literature things that we think are correlates of purpose and meaning to ask, are those still correlates of purpose and meaning in adolescence? And might we be able to disentangle a little bit the notion of purpose from meaning by how these things are related to key issues in adolescence adjustment? And so we had a couple of, the conversation is probably a bit bigger than what I'm going to present here today, but just to get us started here, we started thinking through what we find from the adult literature, that people who have a sense of purpose tend to feel better. And so we thought that might be something we would expect with adolescents, that when they are engaged with purpose, they would feel better or experience more positive mood. But if you look at this relationship in adult literature, it's a little bit more complex than I'm talking about now. It's that people who have a sense of purpose tend to fare better when they're doing things that are important or consistent with that purpose. In fact, people who have a sense of purpose may not do as well when they're sidetracked in some way. If you're clear about where you're going, it may come at a cost to you if you're not actually engaged with that. So when they're self-important, it may, be, it may benefit from that. And also we wanted to explore uh, this issue of curiosity, that indeed certainly some emerging trends in adult literature that individuals who have a strong or a clear sense of purpose in life may be more curious. Curiosity as being sort of a, a strong or appetitive pursuit of new experiences. You, you want to explore some new experience that's gotten your attention, how you want to explore it. Well, people with a sense of purpose, you might think this might go hand in hand. And if you're motivated by a direction, you may have an internal motivation to understand what's going on in the world around you. Is this thing really going to help me get to where I'm going? Is it something I can kind of avoid for now? Association and distinction. Um, excuse me, the same is true with uh, meaning. Uh, I'll go back to this. Uh, the same thing is true with meaning. We thought, given the adult literature, that meaning should be associated with higher levels of, of positive mood. This is all Laura King's work. When people are engaged with meaning and meaning making, they tend to feel better. And they should also experience more curiosity as well to try to explore what's happening around them. But we also added the potential for the idea that when you are engaged with meaning, you may experience more mindfulness or sort of an awareness of what's present state. You're in the moment. You're thinking about who you are and who's around you and what's around you and the relationship between them. And so we thought that might actually be a distinction between purpose and meaning because although both might be to get positive things, it might be meaning engagement, a meaningful engagement that gets more mindfulness, whereas purpose not to these individuals may not be mindful, but they may be focused more on the prospective aim rather than the current situation. So um, that's what we wanted to do. Um, and I think just for, for the sake of time, I'll say that we had, there were several aims uh, guiding our proposal that we wanted to look at, but we wanted to build in enough flexibility to understand both how might purpose and meaning both be beneficial for adolescents, but potentially in different ways, but also build in temporal flexibility that the, the time it takes for both or either to be beneficial may, may differ. That one may be beneficial in the moment when you're doing it, one may be beneficial in terms of long term or sort of over a number of days or weeks or maybe even months. And so we wanted to build that in as well. I think I'll have a chance to say a little bit more about the actual protocols and go forward. Um, with that as our motivation, what we set out to do 
was ask 150 high school students to participate in our study. That was our design. We thought students, but you know, if we can get 150 high school students, that would be fantastic. Um, that's what our goal was. But I'll let Janice be the bearer of bad news. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't bad news. <laughs> But we figured, you know, out of all of the students in uh, in New York State, how hard could it be, really, especially given all of the reach we have through the center to get high school students? Well, not so much. Oh, okay. So our initial plan of center, we started out with, so we started out, and there was a lot of interest. Every school we went to that we had, um, I, I was really, let me just back up. I was really thinking it would be super easy. We just start out, we had, I had multiple possibilities in terms of recruitment, but I didn't think we were going to have to go very far down that line in terms of how far of a net we were going to cast. So the first, uh, the first line of um, recruitment line that we were interested in was to go to New York City because we figured there we could get a really diverse sample and that we could also get, um, we could also, we also had a lot of people to choose from. So there, the, the school that we got connected with there, thanks to Yuda, is Yuda here? Okay. Thanks to you to the school that we got connected there was in fact very very interested in, in working with us and several things happened. The first of which was totally the unexpected, namely a hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, uh, early on. So this happened right at the stage where the school was ready to sign on the dotted line. Although it's hard to say if that actually would have happened, given what everything else that happened next. Now I think hmm, maybe not so much. But uh, that derailed that plan and they basically came back and said that's just not going to it's going to work for us. So we started on our second tier of recruitment and um, here we are now coming into the fall holidays of course and you have these uh, constant when you're working those of you who work with schools know that there's just an array of important dates. There's holidays, there's tests, uh, there's all sorts of different expectations that the state has imposed for students and student performance that mean that the, that the question of whether or not participating in a purpose and meaning study for students, even though the faculty and staff were all always consistently on board with the idea and thought it was a good idea, basically often killed the buzz. So I'm going further and further down our recruitment road thinking, huh, this isn't what I expected. We finally did <laughs> we finally did get a school, a charter school in Buffalo. It was a friend of mine who was very on board, and for him it was easy. He's a principal. It's a small school. They've got a fairly small captive uh, or audience with the students and the, the, the families, which were all just, just happened serendipitously to be coming to a parent meeting that night, the day I talked to him. He was able to present it. They were all on board with it. And but the students not so much. So they 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 were on board with the idea, but it turns out the actual got to fill out surveys kind of thing. We lost them. We lost lots of them actually. How many did we lose? Like 90% of them didn't finish the entire thing. And they were only talking about a week. It was a week study, and but it did require daily completion of the task and the surveys. So at this point, we ended up doing a focus group with the students, which was in and of itself very interesting because I think I think there were like eight people on the line, right? And the three of us, and it was like pulling treat teeth trying to get feedback from the students about why why this was hard. There would be this dead silence for very long periods of time in which I think a lot of sleeping was happening. <laughs> there was also the issue that that wasn't the, um, hang on, we're not quite there, almost. Um, that, that, uh, there was also an issue of this was not the, um, the, the students in the school were quite diverse, but there was a really big subset of students that were uh, Arab and, did, and were Islamic and were not, uh, their parents didn't allow them to use Facebook, which at this point was a pretty core component of the study that we don't really talk, don't talk much about the Facebook component, right? But there, that was part of how we got in touch with people. So we had a lot of really interesting kinds of issues with working with the charter school. So now we're in December. We got a very small number of people. We move into January and we go to another school, another, it was another uh, alternative school, and we get, again, lots of interest. The principal is absolutely convinced this is a go. He loves it. It builds right into their curriculum. It fits right into their curriculum in a beautiful way. But he calls me back in about three weeks and says, I have no idea, but they won't let me, the district superintendent won't let us do this. So um, he said, I'll get back to you and let you know why. And by this time, I'm thinking, okay, this is just dead. Meanwhile, we've got irons in the fire at, at, uh, in Orange County, and they were able to pull it off. However, what's next? Uh, however, in Orange County, it took 
a month and a half, two months, before we, we went from the, the first yes, yes, I think it can go, maybe it can go, sorry, the, the district superintendent's been so, so busy, can't get, we need to get permission to do the passive consent. So we ended up starting, when did we start data collection there? February, the end of February. The end of February, which for the purposes of our study was a little bit tricky in terms of the last data point collection, which will, will make them out of school. So in the end, we ended up learning a lot about what the gap between what uh, schools want and think are important uh, on the ground and what really happens in terms of the pull on their time and their ability to actually implement something like this that is not clearly academically linked. So we ended up with one charter secondary school in Buffalo, one large high school in Orange County. I don't think we made our 150 mark um, for, for our high school students there, but we were able to <coughs> recruit, are you ready? Cornell students. <laughs> I think we came up with this mid-fall when it was pretty clear that things weren't going the way we wanted, so we ended up pulling them in, and they were more than happy to comply for um, credit. <laughs> so we ended up with more, just as many, we ended up with the number that we needed, and we, um, we ended up with some really interesting differences in high school and college students that will probably ultimately be good. I'm going to turn it back over to you. So, yeah, so we, um, we had to augment our sample a little bit. We weren't really getting the numbers of high school students uh, for, for various reasons, as was suggested, but we were able to identify uh, uh, other people who were willing to participate uh, here at Cornell. Um, and so what you're seeing here is really the breakdown of our sample that we actually ended up with. And I'm presenting it here as the two distinct groups because the top is really what we propose, minus a few people, um, but the bottom is, is the augmented sample. But ultimately, everyone was a part of the same study. Everyone was participating at the same time as a concurrent project, but I'm sort of drawing it out here. And I also want to draw out the point that although the sample characteristics you can see there, um, it's important to note that from a developmental standpoint, there were people in both of these samples who were the same age. Some of the high school seniors were the same age as the first year students. Um, but we have sort of chronological developmental story, but there's also a developmental context. Some people were high school students versus, versus college. And so for what it's worth, in some ways maybe sort of serendipitous, we were able to ask questions that we necessarily didn't necessarily think of in the beginning. We weren't really on our radar, but we had the potential to ask now um, once we have this sample going here. But this is where we are right now in terms of our numbers. Um, just to give you one sense of kind of a little overview of, of the protocol, what people were asked to do when they joined the study is they, they began by completing a baseline survey. This is where I think a global concept where people were, wait, I have to actually complete a survey and it didn't really work really well. But once we got going, it was completing a baseline survey was kind of the entry into our study. And then once you completed that, every Monday we started a daily diary phase. I'll say a little more about that in a second, but this was an experimental experience sampling, a daily diary phase that we followed people through. At the end of that one week, they completed a one-week follow-up, which is basically, which I'll break down in a second, but a replication of our baseline study to see if anything they, may, they initially sort of started with had changed after one week of participating in our study. And then that's where we are right now, and we're in between the one-week one, one week follow-up and the two-month follow-up. I think there's a handful of people who have done the two-month follow-up at this point, but over the next several weeks, all of these cohorts will come in and will finish their two-month follow-up at that time. I want to break down for a little bit this daily phase and what was going on there. Is after they completed the, base, the baseline measure, on the following Monday, for some people it was the next day, for other people it was the next two days, on the following Monday, they started their daily assessments. And these daily assessments were essentially brief surveys. Every day we could ask questions about their level of positive and negative mood, curiosity, and mindfulness, the things that we were, were thinking that our, our study might actually have some impact on. And so they were doing this every day for one week. And this is where Jess was also monitoring for a subsample their Facebook account. So above and beyond what they were self-reporting in the surveys, we were also looking at sort of the social presentation of how they, what they post on their wall for their social network or their friends. Um, and that takes a lot of coding, so we're not quite there with that yet, but we have those data as well. Across the week, um, each day was not exactly the same. Um, every other day, we expanded the survey a little bit. And on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, we also added a writing component. And these, this is where we introduced our writing prompts. And we asked people to write about one of three things, uh, purpose, meaning, or control. And this is where the study is a bit of a between-subject design. Once you were asked to write about a particular topic, 
you were asked to write about that, that topic for the, for the subsequent writing days of your study. So you didn't write about different things. You were, if you were in the purpose condition, you were always writing about purpose for the remainder of your week, meaning, so on and so forth, and control, so on and so forth as well. Um, one thing, just while this is all up on the screen and it's kind of faded out on top, this to me is the most exciting aspect of this pilot project, that if you're going to break down all of these different components, it was hard to get this going, but now that we've got the ball rolling, what we were able to do here is really connect, collect um, short-term longitudinal data with an experience sampling burst with an experimental component, both qualitative and quantitative data. So a little bit of everything, really, for what we can do. And that's really what makes the summer exciting for us and building up for what's next. We just have so many different layers here to start to unpack and see how they're all related to one another. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what was what's being assessed at baseline. We assessed all kinds of things. Just for starters here, we assessed demographic or background information, personality characteristics. The truth is we assessed about purpose in life, meaning in life, um, self-esteem, uh, the aspect of resilience, positive, negative mood, all of these sort of traits, excuse me, or dispositional characteristics. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in some ways, it's really sort of embarrassing how much we ask people to, to, to give us in terms of background information, but we did it anyway. Um, and then we followed up with a daily survey. <clears throat> so every one of the seven days, we assessed positive mood, curiosity, and mindfulness with multiple indicators. So rather than just asking people, you know, over your everyday life, how do you feel, we did this in a way that was a little bit more real time. At the end of the day, we asked today, how happy did you feel, how positive did you feel, given a number of positive or negative adjectives, um, but also asked, asked questions about curiosity and mindfulness to get more of a real time assessment of what was going on here as well. Um, in terms of the writing conditions, when you, were, when you joined the study, you completed the baseline survey, you were then randomly assigned to one of these three writing conditions. And the first was a purpose condition. And we asked you to write about purpose, but in sort of a scripted way. We had you respond to these questions specifically. What does it mean for your life to have purpose? Where does a sense of purpose come from? And is it possible for everyone to develop this sense? This is an important point for us. We went back and forth quite a bit on this, actually. And in terms of what's, what's not here is we were not asking people to write about their purpose, to make the assumption that they have one. We essentially wanted them to grapple with the concept of purpose. What does it mean? And in doing this, this might allow us to kind of track, because we asked repeatedly for them to write about purpose, we can track sort of the complexity of the idea of purpose for them as they go through the week. For some people, it may broaden. You may think, well, I want to add this piece, too, as I've had a couple of days to sit with this. For some people, it may narrow. They may really hone in on what it really means to have a sense of purpose. And these questions, these items, really come from um, the published sort of semi-structured interview of Bill Damon when he asks people about their sense of purpose in life. He starts off with these sort of general questions, sort of getting a topography. What does purpose mean? What does it look like? Where does it come from? Sort of basic questions. We repeated the same thing for the meaning condition. Everything similar except instead of purpose, we asked about meaning. What con what's conjured up when people think about the word meaning? Where does it come from? Is everyone pop does everyone have the potential to develop this sense of meaning? Um, and then our control condition was about homework. We also went back and forth on this, and this to me is, although it seems kind of an uh, interesting topic, we thought this makes an interesting control, and I'll explain why in a second, but it's kind of a conservative test that rather than not having them write at all, we wanted adolescents in this condition to actually engage, write about something that they were experiencing in their lives, and we thought um, homework might be a thing. So what have you done in the past 24 hours in terms of homework? How difficult was it? Were you doing more or less than other people? So these are our three writing conditions. And once you were assigned to a condition, this is what you wrote about on writing days. Um, I just want to give you one sample here for time's sake. I won't go through all of these, but this is what we're beginning to do next. What was, in some ways, kind of the more distal idea for me at the beginning has now become one of the more interesting and important aspects of the study to me, and it's really picking apart what they said. It's when you give adolescents sort of a blank screen, keyboard, and say, respond to these questions, what do they say? This is where some people would argue adolescents would leave the screen blank. They wouldn't know what to say about this or um, other people will really struggle uh, in, in responding to this. So here's a chance to see um, what they actually said in response to this. So this is actually from a high school student on their first day uh, writing about the questions about purpose. And they wrote, uh, it means uh, when you know what you want to do in life. Yes, everyone has a purpose in life. You just have to know what that purpose is. I think I'll know my purpose when I decide what I want to do and what I'm really good at and if it benefits anyone. That's my purpose. Having a purpose in life allows a person to really show what they're good at and why they're here. So 
already some of the, the, the definitional terms we discussed already we're starting to find in, in these in these definitions. And it may seem these are hand picked, we have more formal coding is what we have sort of lined up for the summer, but these aren't cherry picked. I didn't look for any particular definition. I just picked out ones that I sort of came to initially in looking at responses. And you see this time and time again, the type of response. Um, just I want to showcase for you what a college student wrote um, on the same day. And without sort of getting lost in all of this text, I'll just say, keep in mind that some of the themes are the same. They may be a little bit more elaborate. They may articulate some differential, like there's some different ideas here, but some of the themes are pretty much the same. This college student wrote on day one, to have a life purpose is important. Without having a purpose in life, one wanders through life without direction. Everyone's life purpose is different, but I think everyone is capable of finding a purpose in their life. Some people, um, some people's life purpose can be very significant, like curing world hunger, while others can be much less significant, like finding a way to be happy. However, both of these purposes are just as important for themselves. People can find their sense of purpose in many different aspects of their life. A purpose can be found in the occupation, the interests, the family their friends, their environment, or other areas. I think that everyone should have the ability to find this purpose before they die. Not everyone is able to find the purpose in life before then, but it's a good full, it's, it's a goal uh, for life to find it before then. I think that because everyone's purpose is found in different aspects of life, it gives everyone a unique purpose in their life. So some of the same ideas are here. That's something you want to do. And the only thing I would add here is there may be a little bit more complexity or this elaboration. They're able to identify different domains in which you're deriving purpose, whether it's family, friends, work, so on and so forth, or even different types of purpose. One's during, one's during hunger, one's being happy. So that's not necessarily offered by the high school example here, but that might be a theme worth delving into as we move forward. Um, I won't delve into all of the, the different examples here, but this is what we're going to have a lot of fun kind of picking apart and developing coding schemes around what youth and college students actually set here. Um, I just want to give you a sense from the college perspective here. A college student in responding to the meaning prompt wrote, for life to have meaning means that you've accomplished what you've set out to do. Whatever your goals may be, if you set them and truly believe in them, your life has meaning. I definitely think it's possible for everyone to find meaning in their life. This sense of meaning comes from your values, beliefs, and experiences. Just one point here, something worth kind of thinking through as we move forward is this, this um, response seems to pick up on this idea of the distinction between having a prospective aim and one that's already been accomplished, whereas if life means uh, that you've accomplished what you've set out to do, whereas purpose is theoretically described as an overarching framework. So you accomplish goals, but it's your purpose to let you know what goal you're going to pursue next. You're never really accomplishing your purpose. You're sort of organizing goals, whereas for here, meaning means you've accomplished your goals and it, and it matters to you in a significant way. You're deriving meaning from that. And also, I won't delve into the control topics as well, but I'll just say this has been the most, one of the most surprising aspects of this is having high school students and college students write about homework. I thought we'd get a sentence or, or if that, but we're getting much more than that. In some ways, they're fascinating as a control topic. Uh, I think Jess will be able to, if you have questions about it, she can certainly, she's been reading these, she'll send me some from time to time and we'll laugh just how funny what they're describing is. Sometimes they are truly elaborating on what it means to have homework. And so it's kind of here, maybe more, rather than just the condition they were assigned to, we have to come up with more sophisticated coding because they're deriving meaning out of homework here as well. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting point. It's human nature. <laughs> yes, human nature, exactly. Um, in terms of the analytic plan, the amount of data that we have and sort of the different directions that they're running, um, there's a lot of different analytic plans that we will be pursuing. But I just want to sort of give you one simple overview for sort of tie the story together with what we're starting to look at because the daily diary are in, is we have multiple levels here. Remember, all of our participants have given us up to seven days of diary data, but those days are all connected within people who are in a, a particular experimental condition. And so we want to we can think of this on a couple of different levels, both the daily level, but also the between person um, level of what condition you were assigned to. And so one question we can start asking, sort of consistent with the ideas we outlined in our initial proposal was, how does it matter what we had you write about for the week in terms of how you fared in everyday life? And just for starters, a little bit of background or descriptive information, I want to showcase this uh, finding here. Statistically, this is not significant, but it's trending. And probably when we start to clean up the data a little bit more, pulling out people's answers probably would not qualify as one or the other. Um, maybe this will become significant. But I want to showcase this, because I think it's kind of interesting is, this is how much you wrote per writing day based upon your developmental context and what you were writing about. So the high school students actually wrote the least about purpose. On writing days in which they were asked to write, they wrote about 37 words per response. 
but they also wrote the most about meaning compared to other groups in the study. They wrote the most about meaning. So I wouldn't suggest that adolescents or high school students here are un unable to think about purpose and meaning, but there might be a distinction for them. Um, and I would say more about this later, but this might be a clue into thinking what's going on during ad late adolescence or high school um, in terms of their um, interest or ability to engage with the concept of purpose, not necessarily their own purpose, but the concept of purpose, and, and homework was somewhere in the middle there. For college students, there really was no difference between purpose and meaning. Asked to write about either, they pretty much gave the same amount of response, um, and a little bit lower about homework here uh, along the Cornell students, which is also perhaps interesting as well. Um, but this is something to keep in mind as we go through here a little bit. Um, I want to show you this. This looks at positive mood over the week. So how did people feel in terms of the level of positive mood or on average over the week? And what, what's centered here at zero is basically a person's average level of mood. If we know you for the college for the whole week, and we look at your average, that would be centered at zero for you. And so anything above or below that really represents sort of above or below your average level of positive affect. And on writing days across our study, on days in which youth were writing, they felt better than on days they weren't writing. And this was not moderated by conditions, the topic, the theme that they were writing about. There was a benefit, in a sense, to being asked and participating in the writing tasks that we had to do. This is kind of interesting. Writing, excuse me, non-writing days here, intersect with zero, basically people felt average on writing days, but they felt above average in terms of positive affect on days they got to write. That wasn't necessarily expected totally, but I think it's an interesting insight into what, what might be really picking up on here. Um, and also the high school versus college sample over there, the same type of thing. We looked across the, across the week. High school students on average felt more positive than college students. Um, to be honest, I was a bit shocked by this uh, when I first found this from a, from a developmental standpoint in terms of increasing mood, but my colleagues have been quick to point out to me that Freshman year of college may not be that fun for people, and so I don't, I don't know if I've forgotten that or not, but that might be what's going on as high school students just felt better than, than our college students, but there might be also something going on here as well as the college students comparatively felt less positive than high school students. This chart shows you um, what happens when you look at positive mood over the, over the week, average levels of positive mood by condition. And what we saw is that Participants who wrote about either purpose or meaning in life felt more positive over the week than those who wrote about the control topic. So there was a benefit. This is good news in a sense. But by, by asking them to engage with the concept of purpose, they felt better, or the concept of meaning, they felt better than those who were writing about homework for the week. So it's not, maybe not all that shocking, but this, this particular concept was uh, associated with higher levels of, of positive affect over the week. The one caveat here, though, is that the purpose effect Grappling with the issue of purpose, writing about purpose, engaging with that purpose, seemed to be better than the control condition. But it was qualified by an interaction with the developmental stage. And if you look at it here, this is what has emerged. And this benefit of writing about purpose seems to be clearest for college students. That college students who were writing about the control topic felt significantly lower uh, positive aspects, less positive than those who were writing about purpose. For high school students, there was the emerging trend in the opposite direction that writing about purpose may actually be less associated with, more, less, uh, associated less with positive affect than writing about the control topic. Um, this has been something we've been staring at and trying to get our heads around for a week now. Certainly much more attention needs to be given to this or what might be going on here. But it wasn't something that was even on our radar when we began because we didn't think we'd have a college sample here of what's going on. There's a couple of ideas. The conversation is open to more suggestions. But there's a couple of ideas that we want to be going on here. One might be the concept of purpose may require some kind of developmental sequence. Maybe this is not something that's necessarily fun for young people to think about. Maybe they aren't really thinking about purpose in a particular moment. Um, whereas college students, maybe there's a benefit to grappling with if I'm going to make my major, what courses I'm going to take, and if I have a chance to write about my purpose, all of that comes together in some way. So it seems to be beneficial, more beneficial for them there. It could also be uh, going back to the clue of how much people wrote. The more people wrote over the course of the study across conditions, the better they felt. And this is the topic for high school students that they wrote the least about. So maybe there's something in those additional sentences or two that college students wrote that separated the difference between having to grapple with purpose and really benefiting from purpose here. All of this, I think, has to be reconciled against really a growing literature that shows that youth who have purpose, including high school students who have a sense of purpose, feel better than those who don't. But what these data suggest is maybe when they are engaging with the concepts, 
it's not as positive as when they're sort of not engaging with it, but maybe have sort of downstream returns. So our two-month follow-up here, I think, was really telling for us and important for us to take a look at. In terms of curiosity, both purpose and meaning were associated with higher levels of curiosity than the control conditions. So writing about purpose, writing about meaning benefited people in terms of daily curiosity. This is a really important finding in that there's emerging research showing that daily curiosity, specifically daily engagement in exploring new ideas and taking on being open to new experiences, begets uh, long-term well-being. It sort of builds these enduring resources. I've seen this before, I've explored it, I understand it, and I can come back to it later on. So that we found a way of manufacturing more, in, more curiosity in daily life, I think is, a, is an interesting and positive sign relative to our control condition. And finally, mindfulness. This is a trending effect. Um, um, purpose was not different to control in terms of level of mindfulness. Meaning was, was trending in that direction, about, about 0.08. Again, maybe with some cleaning up to go, uh, it will become significant, but it's certainly trending in that direction. The individuals who are writing about meaning over the course of the week evidence a trend towards greater mindfulness in their, in their, in their daily lives over that week relative to the control condition. They were not different in purpose, however. Um, I think this is also an interesting effect, and if it, it turns out that it's significant at some point, this would be consistent with our hypothesis. If there's something about meaning that makes people more mindful in their everyday lives, and purpose may not do that to the same extent. Um, just sort of in sum, what are we finding here? What do we think is, is going to happen when we kind of collect everything? There seems to be some suggestive evidence that both purpose and meaning are good things to have. On balance, the pattern of results suggests that those who are engaging with them experience some level of positive outcomes. Although purpose may be more complex, uh, developmental stage may matter here. It may be more beneficial for people who are situated, have already made some decisions, have already committed to some level of identity for them to explore what it means to be them going forward. Maybe that's not really there for people um, who are at, at the high school level to the same extent. It would be interesting to both tease apart the developmental context effects from age effects in terms of, the, of how these things moderate um, the out associated outcomes. Meaning? seem to be beneficial across the board. Adolescents wrote the most about meaning, and when they did, they seemed to benefit from, the, from having done so. There seems to be some benefit to people to engage and try to understand and process who they are in a real-time moment, whereas purpose, maybe, if it is beneficial, maybe for some people, and have some downstream benefits, it's not available right, right away. And I put this here as sort of a note to myself in terms of, there's something here about our, our writing task. Um, that writing seemed to benefit people in terms of positive mood, uh, I think is an interesting effect. And also our choice of, of our control condition. We had people write about homework, um, a topic that I think have, if I asked adolescents to write about homework, I'm not sure what they would even make of that, um, so we don't know their reaction to it. But I think it makes, in some ways, a very conservative control here. Because for the most part, people, adolescents to be sure, are not writing about purpose or meaning or homework in their everyday life. They may be doing homework, we're not writing about it. So I think the fact that we find some benefit to writing about purpose and, and meaning above and beyond writing about um, something that they're experiencing in their everyday life is a, is a really interesting effect. Maybe the effects would be even more pronounced if they weren't writing at all uh, on a particular topic because we know that writing it seems to benefit people uh, regardless. It's reflection. The opportunity to reflect maybe it may be a benefit. And that's not a new finding at all. Reflective writing seems to be, across a lot of different domains, seems to be a benefit to people. So maybe we're picking up on that. But just asking young people to write and think about and engage with certain, certain topics is a benefit. Um, let's, and, let's just actually open up for Q&A. Okay. Rather than go into the implications for working with schools, other than to say that it looks like um, my take home is that it might be easier to do an intervention like this once it's de you know, designed not in a public school system, but maybe in an alternative school system, certainly in colleges. Uh, but at this point, it doesn't look like public schools are probably the best place for slipping in something like this, just because they already seem to have so much on their plate. So, so why don't we open up for Q&A, because we only have 10 minutes left. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering whether you would consider after school programs because I think sometimes those have a little more flexibility and, and not are over programmed in terms of curriculum right. and testing and that kind of stuff. So we, there was one option for after school, but it actually didn't. Yes, I think that's probably a next a next tier. And we talked about 4-H, you know, going through a 4-H program, which was also something that we didn't explore, but that would probably make a lot of sense. But it seems like any place where you find kids that are not in public schools at this point might be the implication for next steps. 
Um, one thing I also add to that is just from, from, from the literature is that after school time is a critical time for young people. And that's where things can either sort of go really well for them or really not well for them. And so I think something like this, of having them engage in something that we think benefits them in positive directions, could be a, a, a really useful placeholder for that time of engaging with this. So maybe after school programs are, are an appropriate place to start. So with the three questions for each writing condition? That, that's those, those were the problems. Problem. Yep. Everything it didn't change. Okay. I'm curious and moving away from public schools to things like 4-H, uh, how you maintain diversity. Uh, and I'm also curious if, if, if the club had been considered as an option for your study. The very first question. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think that yes, I think we approached um, the superintendent who was interested but never followed up again. And and there's always this question of you know how much do you hound somebody, especially in the school system in which your kids are in. Politics. <laughs> 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 Didn't want to get a reputation with the superintendent. So uh, that was the general experience that we had in recruitment was everybody was excited. They loved the idea. They resonate with the idea, and it is a very far cry from what they actually what actually happens when they get on the ground in their office it seems like a distant priority <laughs> yeah they're pretty over yeah, it's swamped packed and, uh, that way. I'm sorry, I, I also had the question about the diversity if you take it out of the public schools. The samples that you had weren't incredibly diverse to begin with. Um, and I'm wondering if the more diverse samples might show different trends. They very they very well might. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a great that's a great question. They very well might. Um um after this project had already been underway, I recently spoke with a few um, extension educators um, who are actually a part of 4-H, but do it in more diverse areas like around New York City. And so um, with those relationships continuing to build, I think we'll have an opportunity to ask whether or not this would be of interest to people. And especially outside, if we move outside of the school context, we can move into these types of things. We'd be more mindful of, of where we're collecting these types of data and what it means more diversity. The, the school that was originally interested in New York City also did say they wouldn't mind being approached again. But, but at this point, you know, the study was over, and a lot of it depends on um, whether or not we package an intervention that, or, or do a, a similar parallel study again in the future. Thank you. Gosh, a lot. You picked. I'm just wondering, do you tell us about the daily stressors, life stress events? Um, I'm wondering if that could have been contributing to the conflict that you thought was going to be undergrad. Could be. Um, in, terms of, in terms of life stressors, there's things in the baseline measure. Around, we didn't talk about it all here in terms of mental health. Um, I don't know if <laughs> but not daily, daily hassles. Measures. We didn't use the daily hassles stuff that would have captured that, but we did do we did do mental health measures that were a little more substantive. Oh, like SPS? We have that. In we have that there. Daily hassles would be good for next round. So I'm, I'm sort of reminded of the work of James Penny Baker and you know, the uh, finding is that uh, sense making in the context of negative experiences, traumatic experiences, are beneficial to the extent that people grapple with that experience by use of pronouns and so forth. That I've even thought about analyzing the data to capture that kind of phenomenon. And sort of the other end of that general finding that sense making the context of positive experiences are actually not beneficial. So the question is if you thought of taking into account the valence of purpose and meaning so that you can sort of get into the new ones. Yeah, um, I have a little. Um, I think that's a really interesting insight. And the way I think about it is 
especially the pen and baker stuff, is usually there's a context where there's an event or pain that somebody and you want them to write about that. This is a little bit more ethereal in the sense there isn't any particular experience we want you to bounce off of and, and write about, although some people may have done that. And so we could code that. Some people's purpose may be uh, the result of some experience and kind of see is there any benefit to them writing about that, whether it's positive or negative. I think the extent that we've thought about this the most is really in terms of the Facebook coding, is we thought about understanding based upon their writing condition what types of information they like to share with the world, whether they, if they're writing about purpose, are they more inclusive? In terms of their status updates, they want to they sort of nominate other peers or friends in their in their status updates or not in terms of the pronoun piece. Um, but yeah, I don't know if we've even I know there's some programs around to analyze writing in that way, tell the program what to look for. But that opens up a lot of doors for us. I think. When we did talk yesterday about applying some of the some of the frameworks to data that we have that's recovery, it's it's qualitative data on recovery from self injury in which people are talking a lot about um, the way that they construe and make sense of their experience that would be helpful. But that, we just literally had a conversation about that yesterday. So I think the idea there would be is if we pull out themes here, is what, when you actually are charged with the task of writing about purpose or writing about meaning, what do you end up saying? And then take those themes that we find to other writing where that was not the charge and see if people mention those themes, are they any better off or worse off for having done so? Um, might be an interesting thing to do. Um, so it seems to me that part of uh, purpose and meaning is somehow maybe caught up in the notion of worth or the search for self-worth that what I do has some worth. And um, the one thing I'm wondering if you're, if you look at is, or if it comes up in the literature, because I don't know if we come up with the data, but whether the notion of worth and the appraisal of that is like extrinsically, it's got an extrinsic locus versus intrinsic. Mm -hmm. It made me think of that. One thing I thought about is religiosity might play in here somehow, or maybe some of your other. I don't know all the. I probably use that five factors as a personality, and I, I don't know them, the nuance of all, and maybe that's picked up somewhere in there. Or socially uh, validated notions of what is meaningful or what would, would lend worth to what you do and who you are versus something more intrinsic. And that may play into the age differences, possibly, because as you're older and you, have, you find your own social group that is the one you would choose when you're in college, which is different than when you're in high school. You're kind of in with the same people you've been with for a long time. Maybe you start to kind of align your intrinsic sense of who you want to be and what, what's meaningful with you. I don't know. That's just, I'm, I'm just trying to see how the intrinsic and extrinsic thing might play in here. It's a great thought. A lot of yeah, a lot of the responses actually um, dealt with intrinsic sense of meaning, like meaning something that someone derives from within oneself. And the same thing with purpose. A lot of them did comment on on that. And it was funny because about probably about a third of participants about both meaning and purpose said that you know, they thought not everyone would find a sense of meaning or sense of purpose in their life, but <laughs> For the most part, they all agree, seem to agree that would be interesting. Well, so so we do. Some of us do a lot of work with very religious people, and uh, I'm pretty sure that a lot of the folks we work with, if we talked about purpose, meaning it would all revolve around uh, religiosity. Yeah, doing God's work. That Redemption. Kind of thing. Redemption, right? That's exactly, right. right. Yeah, and uh, and that's pre-constructed for them. You know, then you find your own way. But it's one of those variables that maybe in a later iteration, if you broaden the sample a little bit, and the issue of diversity is relevant there too. If you look right. in the Bible Belt, you may end up with a very different. That's actually really kind of story. Yeah. I think it's an interesting point. We've done uh, in a high school on another project, we did um, definitions of purpose, not unlike what we did here on a daily basis, but in a, in a one time sense, get young people to think about purpose, what it means, and what their sense of purpose is. And then we coded them for themes. And they broke out, just being the way you did this, as the largest theme that adolescents identified as a purpose is being very pro-social. And in fact, the smallest theme was religious, but it was a clear theme in, in, the, in the paper, and probably a function of where we collected the data as well. But it was certainly for, for these youth. And then what we did is overlaid that sort of an identity framework around how much the youth explored that and committed to that. And what we found is those adolescents who had a religious orientation 
had a much more what we think of as a foreclosed sense of purpose. In other words, they hadn't really explored above beyond the script that had been given to them, but they were very strongly committed to it. Whereas people who had a pro-social orientation tend to be more achieved. They looked around a little bit. Where can, what can I do here? There's a benefit, and then I'm going to commit to that. So there's some. I don't know if it totally gets at the intrinsic versus extrinsic, but it gets at sort of is this something you're right. thinking about, about out of the box, or is it sort of? If it was an experience or right. not. I mean, it's interesting. My, my cousin, uh, my cousin is a, a Mormon, and his whole family is a cousin of Mormon. And they have this process where during adolescence and you know college age, I guess. Or, they do this. They're out into the world, and they have to discover that on their own because that's a that's a scripted part of becoming. In the cl- in, for the, probably for the reason you're saying, it's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just uh, just because one of the things that we're doing with in the agencies we're working with is we talk about helping kids uh, with a meaningful role. And we're just trying to think about adding that role onto that where that takes it because it's actually, I think, for us trying to make it a little more concrete. You mean a role within the agents or a role within? In their life. What's their meaningful role oh. in life? So I just, it's just, that's the way we've approached that, which gets into some interesting because they identify all kinds of things. Actually, the residential care settings would be a really great place to do an intervention and or study like this, actually. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, 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 let's talk about that. And actually, we're working with school districts, um, which I I hesitate to say that because we're going to be doing some surveys, too. I don't know what it could be, but don't give up on the public school thing because I think we're working at a whole district level. Lots and lots of schools, and that might be a possibility. You know, I actually thought when you said you were you were going to go to undergraduates or you were switching, I was thinking they're going to go to the community colleges, and you went to the Cornell students, obviously. We, yeah, we needed something quick and easy. Susan was right there. I, 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 I would seem to me we'd get an entirely different type of population. We might have to apply for another pilot grant. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I know they, they could hang out for a few minutes if anybody wants to come up afterwards, but I know people are going to be at other places now. But So thanks so much. This was great.